the transformation from using a textbook that is a, the type of textbook that just basically tells you procedures and even if it's a one that tries to explain why the procedures work it's still application you know it's not the math that we're talking about right the surprise is gone right it's not exactly there's no surprise there's no generating there's no doing of what mathematicians do i mean mathematicians raise conjectures they inquire they work on arguments on episode 24 we welcome the, the queen problem. of context for learning surprise. mathematics fact, kathy fosno no kathy is a professor no emerita of they education they at city college of new york and was the founder of Mathematics in the City, a national center for professional development located at the college. She's authored over 40 books on mathematics education, including Young Mathematicians at Work series, the Context for Learning Mathematics series, and now her new online platform, New Perspectives. We are so excited for our Math Moment Maker community to dig into this great episode with a champion of fueling sense making in math class as she will share her mathematics journey, including some discriminatory barriers that she had to overcome along the way. Listen in as we speak with the wonderful Kathy Fosno. Play that intro music now. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce from tapintoteenminds.com. And I'm John Orr from mrorr-isageek.com. We are two math teachers who, together, with you, the community of math educators worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark engagement, fuel learning, and ignite teacher action. Welcome, everyone, to episode number 24, Landscapes of Learning, an interview with Kathy Fosno. Get hooked into an intriguing conversation with a game changer in mathematics education who is constantly helping the mathematics education community to mathematize vertically upwards. Kathy Fosno. Before we get into our conversation, we want to let you know that we have just opened up the doors to our brand new Make Math Moments Academy, and it is now accepting members. Our academy will help you create memorable math moments daily with access to curiosity-rich tasks, in-depth PD video trainings, and a system for making these moments a reality. At the time of this recording, we already have over 60 founding members, so if you're looking to build a classroom you will love that generates resilient problem solvers, happy students, and proud parents, check out the Academy and see if it's the right fit for you. You can learn more at makemathmoments.com forward slash academy. That is makemathmoments.com forward slash academy. And now let's get on with the interview with Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. Long time no see for a while there. I felt like I was bumping into you every couple of months, but I think we're <laughs> long overdue. How are things doing over on the East Coast? Actually, I am great. I have had the last month off with no travel, and I have been writing like mad, so I love that kind of precious time. And I have, in the last two weeks, actually finished three new units. Wow. So I know, very exciting. I, I wow. finished one first on a grade four unit. It's called Number Detectives, and it's all about numbers, geometric shapes of numbers, how many factors numbers have, how we can tell, is there any way to predict, all kinds of common factors, multiples, uh, just a lot of fun playing with number. And that's awesome. called Number Detectives. And then I also just finished two shorter units on time for grade one and grade two, time and money. Oh, amazing, beautiful. amazing. Beautiful. That's fantastic. Yeah, we're going to dive deeper into that for sure when we get to some of the resources that we wanted to ask you about as well. So I have jotted those down to make sure we don't forget to come back to those. Kathy, I, th I think for our listeners, if they don't know who you are, would you be able to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Where are you from? What's your teaching story? What's your journey? Can you just fill us in a little bit? Oh, sure. Well, I'm originally from Norwich, Connecticut. And I live actually not far from my old hometown now because I returned here 10 years ago 
and my mom and dad were aging, and I was able to commute into New York for a while from here. And then I ended up settling here. So my history, I think I honestly always loved math. I can't say that, you know, I didn't. In the beginning, I did. It was probably my favorite subject. I loved, I was one of those people that stayed up, you know, with a flashlight under the covers at night reading Nancy Drew Mysteries and the Hardy Boys. And and there was something akin (laughs) to doing that with mathematics for me. It was about solving problems, you know, cracking the mystery. And I was very lucky when I was in elementary school student to have an absolutely fabulous principal who also loved mathematics. And he tried to, some of the students that he knew, you know, really loved math involved with him. And and he would always give a test at the end of the year that was all problems. You know, they were all open-ended problems. And I did, I remember quite well on one of those. And we got the students that did, there were about six or seven of us, got taken to a Red Sox baseball game in Boston. So that was really big for a 10 that year old, amazing. 11 yeah, year old, for, you know. For sure. So or a 38 I, I year old. Yeah. <laughs> so I started off like that, which sounds like it's going to be a wonderful journey. But now let me paint the other side of what happened. When I got to high school, I thought I was going to take a lot of math courses, and my plan was to go to college and to major in mathematics, and I was in my high school geometry class and loving that because, of course, I was finally being asked to prove things, right? What fun. I mean, not only were you cracking the case, you then had to write your argument for you know, the convincing argument. And I was doing very well in that course too. And I went up to my teacher and I had been placed in, we had tracking in my school. It was a very (laughs) large high school, 3000 children. Wow. And we had tracking and I was not in the top. I was in the next to the top. And I asked why I couldn't be in the top math class because I had straight A's. I couldn't show the teacher more of what I could do. I was already doing really well in his class. And he looked at me and he said, well, Kathy, that track is for the boys. Oh, ouch. That track is for the boys who are going to be engineers. And they're in that track because they're going to be taking advanced placement classes at the university. That is so, uh, you know, I mean, it's heartbreaking. And I, I want to believe that things have changed significantly. But the problem is, is that that tracking still does exist. And now it's you know, you might be able to swap out boys for something else, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. Blower, blower, that's, what's, right. What's the blank? that's right. Yeah, yeah, yep. totally. That hurts yep. for sure. Yep. Sorry, carry on. Yep. So then I continued with my high school courses and went to college and signed up for the math track anyway and had to take a few courses first because I hadn't had the advanced classes. And I finally got into calculus and oh my God, the calculus teacher was abysmal that I ended up with. He was known on campus as Flunkamall Small. He gave tests and then curved everything. And I did fine. I mean, I did fine in his class, but I wasn't learning anything. You know, I mean, you could get a 20 on his exams. And as long as it was better than other students, he used a bell curve, you'd get a, a C or a B or an A or whatever. But I wasn't learning anything. And the math I loved wasn't happening. And so what I ended up doing was switching majors. I switched into elementary ed. I took math electives because I loved math. And I ended up with a sort of self-designed program in math, but not a degree in mathematics. I had a degree in elementary ed with a specialty in math. So that's my history of how I started. Now, how did I end up now? I ended up in the department, you know, where I was teaching math to students, to teachers. And of course, it became my love again. And I want to tell you two things that were instrumental in changing my whole career path. Because when I first got out with my PhD, I had specialized. I also have an art degree because I'm a painter. I had a real interest in writing. I love to write. And the first position I took at a university teaching was in writing. 
Oh, wow. Well, I was going through a divorce, and I want, I have joint custody of my children when they were young, and so I had to take a position that was very near my ex-husband, and the only position I could find right near me so I didn't have to move was literacy, but they also wanted someone to teach cognitive psych, and that was also my specialty because on my PhD, I had focused on cognitive development on epistemology. I was really curious about how people come to know, which was probably why I loved the math that I knew, you know, when you were actually generating it and proving it. Um, It was about making meaning. And what ended up happening was that I taught literacy for about 10 years at the university in Connecticut. And I had written a couple of papers on ed tech and on cognitive psych and on constructivism in particular. And I had won an an award on constructivism and ed technology. And I was asked to come. Do you know Marty Simon? No, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't think so. A researcher. And he's a professor in math education at NYU. Anyway, he had a grant with NSF at Mount Holyoke College, and it was called Summer Math for Teachers. It's now the Big Idea Project that Deborah Shifter and a few others are involved with, so you may know that. Anyway, he invited me to come and give a talk on constructivism, and I watched Marty teaching math to teachers, and it was all about inquiry. And I said, oh, my gosh, you know, somebody knows how to teach math. (laughs) (laughs) I took a leave of absence from my university. I said, I'm going to switch careers. I joined Marty and Deborah Shifter at Mount Holyoke College for a couple of years and loved it. And then switched into math. And the second example I want to give is that When I started doing inquiries with my students, teaching in in a way that, you know, where I was more mentoring rather than expecting them to get my answer, I was trying to get underneath their thinking, they would often go in directions that I was unprepared for. You know, I had my way of solving a problem, but my students would often go in different ways, as students will do. And I was trying to follow their thinking and get underneath what they were doing. And I was known, people that worked with me in Math in the City will tell you, I was known for staying up all night if I had to, trying to crack inquiries. And the math I now know did not come from the formal preparation of a PhD in math ed. It came from working with my college students, K-8 teachers, and doing math with them. Right. Right. And staying up all night, likely, and right? staying <laughs> up all night. I mean, I was curious, you know. I mean, it's why I always For loved sure. math in the first place. I wanted to figure out the increase. I wanted to model the problems in a variety of different ways. I wanted to see where my students were going and how their strategy was different than my strategy. And I stayed up because I was hooked. I mean, I stayed up all night for geometry in high school because I would do every problem in the book so that the teacher could never throw a problem at me I hadn't already solved. But it wasn't so that you were better prepared to be a problem solver on the test, but because you had seen every possibility, right? So it was sort of like, you know, whatever they could throw at you, you're ready to take it. And you didn't really have to do that inquiry piece like you just described, right? You would just sort of know what to do. Well, I would do the inquiry, you know, at home. That's why I stayed up all night. <laughs> I'd work <laughs> on proofs. I'd solve the problems that I thought were typical of the type he was going to put on a test. Was I just yeah, trying yeah. to get the best grade? I don't know. Honestly, I can't remember back that far. I just know that I wouldn't have stayed up all night if I also didn't love what I was doing. Right. So it wasn't just for the grade. And when I was doing it with my students, it clearly wasn't for a grade. It was because I loved it. You know, I wanted to solve the problems. I wanted to understand their thinking. Yeah. These past six years, I feel the exact same way. Like I feel like I've learned so much more now. And I know that a lot of what I learned when I was younger was obviously foundational and very important. Otherwise, I wouldn't be thinking the way I am now about certain ideas in math and trying to figure them out. But actually, a colleague of mine, uh, Yvette Lehman, she is a, a big, big fan of yours as well. 
She was actually very jealous that I was going to have an opportunity to chat with you tonight again. And her and I will send pictures of different solutions, strategies, trying out different models and trying to figure out those in-betweens. And it sounds a lot like probably what you were sort of tinkering with back then when you had made your switch from the previous university over to the Summer Math for Teachers program. Yeah. And then from literacy to math, feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, you have to be a risk taker because you don't know what your students are going to do. And the fun of teaching this way is that you're learning as you're teaching. You know, you're not teaching what you know. I mean, of course, in a sense you are, right? I mean, we design problems, we bring them to our students because there's certain mathematics that we're working on with them. But you don't always know when you're teaching this way what students are going to do with the problem. And so you've got to be curious. You've got to enjoy the process of the doing of math. You've got to be willing to take risks and work with them. And that's what a good mentor does. And I think the role that we're all trying to play now as we shift our teaching more to this model is that we're becoming mentors. Yeah. You know, uh, there's a question that we ask all of our guests and all of the teachers that we talk to. And I think, you know, you've answered some of this already, but I'd want to give you a chance to add to it. But we always ask uh, people like, what is your most memorable math moment? It could be in school or teaching, but, you know, you've given us a lot already. So I just wanted to give you one more opportunity if there was something else that pops into your mind in the history of your math experience as a student or as an educator? Is there anything else you want to add to that memorable math moment? Oh, goodness. There's so many. So I don't know if there's only one. I'm thinking to one day I was working with students and we were doing mental arithmetic and one of the students had the problem 17 times 23. And my colleague Martin Dulk solved it by with 20 squared minus 3 squared. And I said, oh, now that's interesting. <laughs> <It is. laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it, too. And, and so I was completely hooked. I said, why does that work? Wait a second. Wait a second. So, you know, I went home and I played with arrays and I cut out pieces first and saw what was happening with the array. But then I said, OK, there's got to be a way to also model this algebraically. And, of course, then you see that it's, you know, uh, A plus B times A minus B, and all of a sudden the middle terms are dropping out, and you end up with the A squared minus B squared. I mean, I didn't know where that was going to go, but I loved trying to solve it in a variety of ways. It's that surprise. I think you mentioned you were at at the Windsor conference, the OEME leadership, and you know, great conference. Yes, it was great, wasn't it? And you know, Dan and I and Graham, uh, Graham. Yes, thank you. Um, we, you know, we're, we're speaking and Dan went the night before me. And what I loved about one of the things he said was the surprise, you know, when you hit upon something and you know that I then looked up one of my first grade lessons that I'd filmed in Canada and started the next morning with it because I loved, loved the little first graders. They were oh, shocked yeah. about, they were fabulous talking about odd and even numbers. But it is that surprise, isn't it? Yeah, that part I love so much was that, you know, he had described that very same situation with, you know, the adding an odd, any odd number with another odd number will come out even. And like everyone in the audience was sort of like, that doesn't seem that surprising. And you knocked it out of the park the next day when you brought that those students chatting about like, these ones have a middle and these ones don't have a middle. And I (laughs) I just thought that was so slick, you know, after dinner and you said, oh, I've got to go and, you know, get ready for tomorrow. And, you know, it all connected the next day. I'm like, that's why she had to go get ready for tomorrow because she's pulling the audible. That's why I, that's, I wanted to find the video clip. That's right. Oh, that was was so great. What's wonderful, and we can talk about this later in, in the broadcast if you prefer, but you know that I've been working on this online platform that's full of video and that 
um, building a PD system. I think actually you're using it in a couple of schools, aren't you? Yes, we are. We had a free trial and now we actually have the full license for, I believe we have its 40 teachers involved in it. And uh, so far the, yeah, the response has been really positive. And I mean, there's just so much great content people can just gobble up depending on where they are and what they're after. So that's great. Thank you. To, that's that. why I was able to get that video clip that night so quickly because it's on my whole video library is on that platform. And so I know all the different videos, you know, that we filmed through the years and the classrooms and what the content is. And I knew we'd actually filmed a sequence actually in Canada, in Ontario at the York board. And I had that first grade lesson where the kids were talking about odd and even numbers. So that's why I went and grabbed it. Well, you know, while we're discussing, why don't we kind of take a little bit of a side road here and chat a little bit more about that. The platform is called New Perspectives. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that platform? Maybe when when you thought to create such a tool and maybe tell us a bit of the story there. Well, first, I think I'm going to take a little bit of an excursion first and talk about PD in general, professional learning in general. Because one of the things that I've learned through the years is that this is a very steep journey for all of us. I mean, I've been learning as I've been doing this now for over 40 years, yet we also expect the teachers that we work with to get excited and then to be able, and they do, they get excited. They're in a workshop, they get excited, they say, great, I can do this. And then they go back to a classroom, right? And it is like the transformation from using a textbook that is a, the type of textbook that just basically tells you procedures. And even if it's a one that tries to explain why the procedures work, it's still application. You know, it's not the math that we're talking about. Right. The surprise is gone, right? It's not exactly. There's no surprise. There's no generating. There's no doing of what mathematicians do. I mean, mathematicians raise conjectures. They inquire. They work on arguments. They find ways to model the problem. They love the surprise. They, In fact, if there's no surprise or it's a trivial problem, they just say, well, that's a trivial one. Why bother doing it? I don't know the answer answer yet, but I know what I would do. So why bother? Where's the fun in that, right? Yeah. So if we expect teachers to change their teaching to be more generative and, you know, to help learners generate mathematics and to be able to have really good problems that they can do with kids and to know how to question in powerful ways, that is a very steep, steep learning journey. And so the bulk of my work has always been professional learning, whether I'm doing workshops and trying to think about what to do with the workshops, whether I'm writing units and trying to put enough information in the unit so it isn't just a host of activities. It's got boxes behind the numbers. Why did I choose this when I wrote that string? Or here are the, some of the examples of what you'll likely see your children do when you do this investigation. And if you're going to confer, here's some tips on what you might want to try to do. You know, writing all that kind of stuff. Having professional development as the real thrust of my work, I finally reached a point in the last, oh, I don't know, 10 years or so, My colleague Martin Dulk and I, actually it's more than 10 years ago, got a big grant from NSF to start filming classrooms of my really fine, fine teachers, teachers that I've worked with for years that, you know, I knew that they were good examples of this work and building professional modules, professional learning modules around the footage. And our first attempt was, and this will tell you, this will, when I tell you the technology, you'll see the date on this, you know, they were (laughs) CD-ROMs. Right. (laughs) They were CD-ROMs. It's better than floppy disks, right? right? So that's okay. Better than a book, you know, a book that's a book that has a CD with it. Right, it was probably cutting edge, (laughs) cutting edge. (laughs) It was cutting edge back then. And then, of course, from that, we went to DVDs because we could host more video on it. But then, of course, the DVDs are old as well. And so 
five, six years ago, Martin and I said, look, let's just take those old DVDs off the market, do a whole lot more filming. So we also have a lot of new footage as well and build an environment that isn't, you know, online. And that's what we started doing. And so we've been filming now for about four years, three years, three or four years. Martin films me talking about the footage. We have all the samples of children's work, so I can use the samples and do online modules with teachers about the work samples. But the other thing we're doing with it is my curriculum. I call it that in Canada. You would call it a program. So my program, my resource is now over 40 units. I think in Ontario, mostly people know my early units, which they tend to call the kits. And the kits have about 18 units in them. But I now have over 40 units on the market. I'm pushing to make it a full program, a full core program, so that teachers have enough materials to use. It's not a textbook. It's individual units, but teachers have enough individual units on topics that they can do math workshop every day. Nice. Um, That's beautiful. You know, and it, and then I filmed every one. And so the back to the, I'll just say this one last thing. I don't, no, it's I don't okay. Go ahead. Monologue here. <laughs> but the online platform has the filmed footage of all of the units. And so it allows teachers that are using the units to just go online and have examples of me and a teacher in a classroom with kids doing that exact unit that they are now about to embark on. You know, that's actually what I was about to ask that Kyle and I have been kind of diving into this realm too. And we know it's a lot of work. And the one thing that I was thinking about for you is is like, what does it look like from a teacher's perspective? If a teacher logs on and they get to your module, what's the most value that teacher gets out of the tool? It sounds like you alluded to that just a little bit, but like, how does a teacher see that fitting into their regular classroom routine, like their daily planning routine? First, there's many different things you can do with the platform. It's sort of like asking the question, well, what do you do on the net? You know, and you mm-hmm. can say, well, it depends on what I'm, what I'm <laughs> right. searching for right. or, you yeah, know, you go I'm, to Google, what I'm right, doing of course. with it. You, you go to Google, right? So when you go to the platform, you have a whole bunch of different things you can do there. And you can search and you might search for a unit that you're about to use. And if you do, the unit comes up and now you still have choice. If you're a beginner with my units and you don't even know what Math Workshop looks like in a classroom or you've never used the unit before and you just want to know what it's about, then you click on getting started and you have some choices there. Math Workshop, what does it look like? Overview of the math in this unit. Overview of the unit itself. But if you're a more experienced teacher, you might not. And maybe you've even already taught that unit once. And your interest is not what's the unit about. Your interest is learning to question better or learning to plan math congresses. Which pieces of work do you use? Or maybe it's my landscapes and you want to study the landscape. Then you go there. Again, tip of your finger. You take the pathway you want. It's a multi-pathway program. I've been inside and I'm picturing, you know, as you're talking, I'm like, yep, been over there. Yeah, awesome. You know, so there it is like a Google for everything mathematics and particularly in the style of that Kathy's put together, which is fantastic. So you had mentioned two things about Math Workshop and Math Congress. And I'm picturing myself, if there's a listener at home right now who's going, okay, I'm feeling kind of stuck You know, you've described how the textbook tends to teach things procedurally and kind of, you know, takes away much of that surprise. Even a textbook that really tries to do it really well, it's like, you know, at the bottom of the page, the surprise is right there. You have to, you know, almost instruct kids to put their arm over that portion of the textbook so they don't see the surprise if they want it to be. So could you help them understand, like, what would Math Workshop look like? So I'm a brand new teacher or at least a new teacher to this way of thinking about math pedagogy and teaching. What does a math workshop consist of? What does it look like if I was to walk into Kathy's classroom? Well, first, it's not always a three-part lesson. It might be some days, but it's not often a three-part lesson happening all on the same day. So let me start there because a lot of people think of math workshop as being a three-part lesson, you know, where you have the development of the context, then you have kids go off and work, and then you bring them back and you have a share. So 
Ours is a little bit different. I think of Math Workshop as basically turning the classroom into a community of mathematicians. There are always mathematicians in the community. Math Workshop may only be an hour a day, and it may start on one day with a mini lesson with a string of related problems. And then the context is developed, but the kids may be working on that problem for the rest of the math workshop in pairs and the teachers moving around and conferring and kids have math journals and they're writing down what they're noticing. They're trying things, they're modeling it. And then they turn in their journals that night and I read their journals and I comment back. So I'm getting to know my kids better in terms of what they all did because I maybe only got around to confer with three or four pairs of kids, you know, and I didn't get to all the other kids. And so the next day we pick up where we might start where they read my notes that I wrote to them in these dialogue journals where I commented on what they're trying to do with the problem and I do a little math with them in the journal. And then they join peer review groups. And in the peer review groups, they're usually two pairs partnered now for groups of fours. And the kids talk about what they've been doing with each other. And then they go back to work and they start, I confer a bit more. And then as they're working, and then they move into writing arguments. So now the conferring shifts a little bit away from where before on the first day I might have been conferring in a way that was going to support kids as they're working on the problem and trying to get underneath their strategies so they make progress, you know, suggesting ways they might model and so forth. But the next day as they start postering, I'm now trying to get under their arguments. And so I'm trying to support them to write a cohesive mathematical argument getting questioning on what do you want your audience to know? How are you going to convince them? How are you going to hook them? And then we have a gallery walk where their arguments are posted and we all go around with review pads and we read a few of the arguments. I spread the class out so that everybody does three or four. Nobody does them all, but everybody gets comments. And then after the gallery walk, people read the comments that they got from reviewers. And then we convene a math congress. And the math congress is where I picked two or three posters that I think are going to foster some deep conversations. So sometimes it looks like a progression, you know, from least efficient strategy to more. And people think I'm always carving congresses that way, but most often I'm not. That's more the banshu that the Japanese do. More often I'm picking posters where I see kernels of big ideas. And I know that if I have that poster as a focus of discussion, I'm going to be able to push beyond just solving the problem to a generalization of something big. Freudenthal calls the difference between those two as vertical mathematizing and horizontal mathematizing. Horizontal mathematizing is when you just go from problem to problem to problem. Vertical mathematizing is when you push towards generalization and you begin to go vertically with your conferring and you push for almost a mathematizing of the mathematics. Almost like following that trajectory, like pushing them up that developmental trajectory. You know, when you're going horizontally, you're still grounded in the context. But there are moments after kids have modeled and solved the context and generated some powerful mathematics where you just want to dig into the generalization of the mathematics. And then you leave the problem and, you know, you get into conversations where you broke this up when you multiplied it. You're saying that whenever you multiply, you can break it up. Yeah. Does it always work? And how are you going to defend that that works? Now you're moving into proof. Yeah, I love that. Uh, It's very clear to me as I'm picturing, you know, moving horizontally. And then it's almost like when you move to that, you know, mathematizing vertically, it's almost like coming to the realization that that context was there to kind of spark that curiosity and kind of get you on this train. And now that we've got you, 
now we're going to like ask these what if questions like, well, what if this, you know, what if that? And yes. that's when you sort of depart from that activity or from that context is what I'm hearing. It's mentoring moves and it's back and forth, back and forth. You've got the landscape, you know, the landscape of, you know, if it's multiplication that kids are working on a multiplication inquiry of some type, you know that multiplication landscape. And it informs the kinds of questions that you're asking. And you go back and forth from horizontal to vertical, constantly trying to support movement on that landscape. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, we've been diving into that a lot lately. And, you know, it brings up the idea of how intentional we choose the tasks or activities or those contexts or even just like the examples, it's so key. Like we need to be clear, even with just ourselves as teachers on what learning goal or progression we're aiming towards. And, you know, like not just going to grab any old question out of the textbook or, you know, Googling fractions and picking a task they found on somebody's website. Like we've been finding, you know, it's so important to choose the task wisely for your students. Uh Uh, I I know you have some thoughts on this. Uh, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, too, because I don't know if you could hear me in the background. Oh, (laughs) yes, I was, you know, (laughs) agreeing with, with the points that you were making wholeheartedly. I think what I saw in the U.S., I mean, I remember the work I was doing with Marty Simon and Deborah Shifter. And, you know, a lot of people were still using textbooks. But the big movement that was starting to happen in the U.S. was using rich problems with kids. And, you know, with low floors and high ceilings and really involving kids in the doing of math. What I found, however, is that at least in the States, people still had a didactic of just doing an open-ended problem. And then the, the next day it would be a different problem and the next day a different problem. And the hard thing that I found that teachers were having to grapple with is they would say, but I can't just do problems every day because I'm responsible for these year end objectives and I've got to ensure that my kids get there. So I can do problem solving one day a week, but I can't do it every day. And I think that was coming from not having thought and in the US educators, and I don't mean teachers right now, I'm talking about curriculum designers. So what I did, I started learning about what the Dutch were doing. I felt like they had a piece of the problem. They were using what they called learning lines. That's way too linear for me now. But back when I was learning about what they were doing, when they would write curriculum, they had a line, a developmental line, like a hypothetical trajectory, you know, of investigations that they thought would build upon each other. And they were using context and crafting it very purposefully in order to engender progress. So, you know, if let me give an example. If you want to develop the ratio table, you might start with a grocery problem where kids are having to figure out, you know, the cost of a turkey with kilos and they're developing a chart. You know, if it's one kilo, it's blah, blah, blah. If it's two, if it's four, if it's eight, and they're developing charts. And then these charts, you start playing around with the chart. And then a series of problems might be charts that you give to kids where part of the information is there, but not all of it. And then they're developing strategies to move around the charts. And then you generalize from that and you're developing scaling. I saw your lovely talk with um, your session with Phil last year, you know, on scaling and scaling in tandem. And so if you know that that's important, then you design contexts that are actually going to generate conversations around the scaling. And so that's what the Dutch were doing. And I was fascinated by that because that's not what we were doing in the U.S. We were just designing low floor, high ceiling, nice problems, rich, nice. And you'd have a really good day with your kids and a lot of nice strategies. But then the question was, all right, what do I do tomorrow and the next day and the next day? And so I thought the Dutch were doing some interesting things with context. So I took a leave and I studied with them and I also got money from NSF and I brought many of the Dutch people from the Freudenthal Institute over to work with me. 
And then when, after working with them for several years, Martin Dulk and I wrote the Young Mathematicians at Work books. There's four of them out on the market now. We published those in 2001, 2002. And Bill Jacob actually did the fourth one with me on algebra, but one's on early number sense, one's on addition and subtraction, multiplication, division, fractions, and one on algebra. And what we tried to do in those books is move away from a linear pathway towards a landscape. And we tried to connect strategies with structures So Piaget talks about structures, and as a mathematician, you know what I mean when I say structures. Number is a structure, right? Multiplication is a structure, and the number system is a structure, and mathematicians are building structures. My notion of big ideas is not the same as, for example, in Canada, Marion Small's work is well known. And she, of course, talks a lot about big ideas. But I'm defining big ideas differently. I see big ideas more as learners building structures. So it gets at the heart of the doing of mathematics. And It can therefore also be a big idea in mathematics because mathematicians years ago invented that structure. But when a learner is inventing a big idea, the learner is actually structuring. Placing Mm -hmm. bricks here and, oh, that doesn't quite work, and then moving it over there. and And that little boy that you saw on the tape with the odd and even numbers was structuring the number Mm -hmm. system into even and odd numbers and exploring the properties of what he could do with the even and odd numbers. You know, what happened when he used operations with the even and odd numbers? That's structuring. And so, to me, the big ideas are akin to the process of structuring and then the generating of a structure, which to me, along the way, there are big ideas that are being invented. They're generalizations about the structure. So the distributive property to me and to Marion Small would both be a big idea because it's in, for me, it's involved in the structuring of number in relation to the operation of multiplication. But right, anyway, right. you know, what we tried to do in those books and building those landscapes was to build networks because the brain is actually building a cognitive network. And, you know, we try as humans, we try strategies and our strategies are progressive. They they move from informal to efficient and more formal strategies. There's a progression. The Dutch call it progressive schematization. But there's also the structuring. And then there's also the modeling. And so we have to think out which models for a given topic do we know we need to generate for multiplication. There are critical models. The open number line is critical early on when kids are doing repeated addition. And it's also a lovely model for kids to start exploring common factors and common multiples because they're, Mm -hmm. you know, the number line becomes a double number line. But to shift from additive structuring to multiplicative structuring to get at that scaling, we need to shift to a ratio table. And then, of course, there's the array if we want to get to quadratics and partial products. Base 10 blocks won't get us there. They're too Mm -hmm. rigid. They're designed for the four partial products to get to the algorithm. They're not designed to flexibly build the partial products that somebody with good numeracy is going to build. You know, you can't break the palette up. So the models we choose and how we generate the models also becomes really important. And that's why my landscapes are models, strategies, and big ideas. And I'm trying to look at how they cluster, how they're near each other. It's not a linear pathway. And educators, it seems like we, you know, I guess it's a human thing. We want that Mm -hmm. linearness, right? We're on and off type people, right? We want yes or no, like, but unfortunately with mathematics so many times, it's like, it depends. And I'm picturing your landscapes, even though I feel like I know them well, you know, I can see them and how they're structured. And it is very interconnected and like a web, as you've described. 
But now I'm even looking at them even from a different light or a different perspective, just just visualizing like certain students that are building these structures, as you've described, building their own understanding and that, you know, Tommy sort of heads this direction and then Molly heads this direction. But at some point, they're going to have to sort of meet like they'll converge at some point. And when you look at the landscape, sometimes, you know, for the first time you could look and go, whoa, there's a lot there. But in reality, that's just what it is. It's hard work. Like it's really important for us to know that it's not going to always go down that perfect path. Like I used to plan with my long range plan and I had all my topics and my lessons all set up. And by day four of the course, I was like, whoa, I'm like way off track. And probably because I was not paying any attention to this idea that, you know, my plan is a linear one. And unfortunately, that's not how learning right. works. I mean, the mind is built around neural pathways and synapses, right? And so it depends on the experiences we have, the strategies we try, the structuring we've done, and all we can do in a classroom. I think we can plan sequences of big, nice, juicy problems. And in some sense, that is a little more linear when you're building a unit. But the problems themselves are open enough. You know, each investigation has low floor and high ceiling. So kids are going to do all kinds of different things. And then when you're moving around and conferring, it's really all around the landscape. And now, actually, by the way, Kyle, I think people are most familiar with the original three because those are the ones that are in the kits, you know, with the four operations. But I think I have, I don't know, 10 or 12 on the market now because I've done geometry and measurement. Wonderful. And, you know, the last couple of weeks I was working on time. One of the things teachers often say to us when we present them with ideas and new strategies is... What does that look like? Like, how do I get started? Like, they love these ideas and they're like, what I do to begin. And when I think about your, when teachers land linearly and it makes so much sense to think of the landscape instead, what do you say to teachers who are scared of this, like non-linearity? Like, what do you suggest to them? Like, how do they start? What could they focus on? Like, what would be their next action step? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going, I don't want this to come out wrong because I'm not trying to push my materials. Please trust that I'm not. If I wanted to make money on my materials, I'd charge a whole lot more than I'm charging. I think, I think my, my, my units sell for about $30. So <laughs> the whole program isn't going to cost very much right. <laughs> with 40 <laughs> units. That's the whole program, right? So, yeah. so I'm not, I don't want this to come out like I'm trying to push my materials. But the reason I finally sat down and wrote units is because the question that you just mm -hmm. asked me is exactly what what my teachers were constantly right. asking. And if I only give them a problem to start with and I give them the landscape, it's still overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You know, right. I mean, I was in classrooms in the early days of math in the city four days a week. And I would be designing sequences with teachers, planning problems. I didn't even have landscapes at that point in time. You know, we were just coming up with nice problems and analyzing children's work. But even that wasn't enough. And that was every day. I can't, you know. It, so what I tried to do is write units that teachers could just pick up and get started. And then just design the online platform so they could see it in action. They could study the video. You know, they hear me talking with them. I analyze children's work on there with them. That's the only answer I have for your question, honestly. Do yeah. I think it's enough? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what, though? It makes complete sense. Like, I'm visualizing myself. And the reason I really like the tool is... Because as a teacher, you know, just like you're saying, it's like I can start basically wherever I am. It's not like, you know, I have to go back to the beginning. I could go where I am today and I can step in there and I could watch a very short video clip. It's usually whatever the three minutes and get an understanding as to why that context, why this idea, where it's going and sort of like the intentionality behind it and get started. And in a way, 
that's almost like you putting the teacher in the same place that we want to put our students in, which is to construct this new learning because we can't press pause on life and then, you know, go and do three years of going through the entire system and feeling 100% confident with everything before I come back to the class. I just need to get started. And that's sort of the message that I'm hearing from you. Uh, and I really like, and I think the tools design in a way that it can help teachers get started that way. And even if people don't have the platform, you know, the online platform, if they just pick up a unit, you know, they're two weeks long, if they get started with a unit, that's the easiest way to start. Kathy, it's been an amazing discussion so far. We have just a couple short questions here for you. We like to ask people uh, before we head out on our way, we know how important, and I know you know how important reflection is in order to generate new learning. So why don't you share with the audience, what is sort of your professional development focus right now? I know that you've been working on those units, but what's the math concept or the math idea? Maybe it's pedagogy. Uh, what's going on in your brain right now that you're trying to work through? Because I almost want to bet that there's something up there that you're kind of working on and maybe just kind of tinkering with late at night before bed. Well, first, let me mention my book on um, making moments matter. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great title. Before That's we a great title. I know. I love I, when I realized that you and didn't no. know my book and I didn't right. know what you were doing when we both discovered yeah. this. We just on our own came up I, with similar titles. I think we were in the car when I picked you up from the airport uh, back in the summertime and we were driving and we were just chatting and we sort of made that connection like, yeah. what? oh, well, that's yeah. awesome. Well, yeah. clearly it must that's have been right. a good title. Yeah. So that book is now two years old. So it's not my brand new work, but it's a book on conferring. I studied, I really wanted to spend time really thinking deeply about conferring moves and how they're different when you're developing proof, how they're different when you're supporting a learner to go further with the inquiry. And so that book is called Conferring with Young Mathematicians, colon, Making Moments Matter. And that's an Amazon book. Anyway, my- We'll add the, uh, the link to the show notes oh, for yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. Oh, by the way, that book also has scans, quick scans in it. So you can actually see several conferrals when you're reading the book. With you, If you have your cell phone with you and you just download oh, beautiful. that app. Like little videos cool. you can little check out. Little video really cool. you can watch on your cell phone as you're reading. Nice, nice. nice. I My love that. My most recent work, aside from filling out you know, the units to be a full core, some of the more recent things I've been spending time with is... Thinking in literacy, how they do mentor texts. Do you know any of the literacy work that, of Lucy Calkins? And she'll use mentor texts where kids will study like the way of writers crafting a lead or something. And I'm fascinated by how something like that could occur on the writing of proof. Because we're faced in mathematics with a different issue. The child obviously has to develop a proof. You know, you can't show a child a proof. But on the other, and adult proofs are too hard for children to read and understand. God knows I can't understand most of them and depends on the math. But <laughs> right, I mean, yeah. that's no, my, 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 my level <laughs> is not the level of a professional mathematician. So how do we introduce children to the writing of proof? You know, early on, we encourage them to write a convincing argument, and all of that's good. That's where we have to start. But somewhere along the line, I don't know, grade three, grade four, grade five, we need to start introducing some crafted proofs that are simple enough on the mathematics that children have been working on that they would be able to understand and talk about as a mentor text. That's so interesting to me because here in Ontario, we have our process expectations similar to the practices in Common Core. And one we have is reasoning improving. And for each division, we have our primary division, junior, intermediate, then senior, all the way from basically grade one to grade 12. And you can see this reasoning improving sort of doing, or at least 
telling us what we're supposed to do in a similar fashion, but without the how, you know, so we're trying to help kids with making conjectures. And I heard you mention conjecture earlier like that. I love that idea of, you know, for me, that's what inquiry is all about is getting kids to really go like, I wonder if, or I think that when you do this, that happens. And then it's like, oh, you know, it worked there. Is that just a coincidence? And let's try some others. Let's see if we can figure this out. But I'm not too certain how many of us educators in the classroom are able to really help develop that reasoning improving. And and so that really struck a chord with me, that's for sure. Well, I'll tell you what I tried. If this interests you, I would invite you to join me in trying to explore this because I'm in the very infancy of trying to figure this out with this topic. But I've tried one thing so far. I was in a third grade classroom. If you go onto the platform someday, Kyle, go in and look for, it's an orange unit. I filmed it in grade four and it's called puzzle packing. And if you go to supporting the investigations, you'll see several videos there about conferring. And there are two where I'm conferring with three boys and I'm conferring on the title of one of the clips is Structure and Regularity, and the title of the other clip is Building an Argument or Argumentation. I don't remember now exactly what I called it. But what I was trying, I'm trying there to help the kids craft an argument. They have discovered, well, it's long and you probably want to sign off. It's, we've been on for a while. Should I keep going? I'm actually very curious. Okay. So (laughs) So if other people aren't sad, you know, unfortunately (laughs) for them. (laughs) Sorry, everyone. (laughs) If it's too long, you can cut it. (laughs) We could always Uh, do that. That's the beauty of technology, right? Yeah. So puzzle packing is about puzzles like Rubik cubes that come in cubes. And we had the kids figure out how many cubes would be in a whole host of different boxes that are structured like the base 10 blocks. So the tool that we had available were base 10 blocks. But the only thing we told the kids was that the little cube comes in a cube box, you know, one puzzle. And then there's a long box that holds 10. And then there's a pallet that holds 10 of the 10s. And then there's, you know, the big shipping box where there's 10 pallets that get stacked. And then there's the shipping box being taken out to a truck and it gets layered in on the bottom to become a big, big pallet and then a giant, massive cube. And the kids have to figure out how many Rubik cubes are actually in that shape. Now, what the kids, and then the last part of it, which happens three on day three or day four afterwards, is... So now that you know how many are in there, there's actually a million. How is that truck going to be able to go down the road? (laughs) How big did that truck have to be? Is this this even possible? (laughs) Yes. Yes. No, and of course it's not. It's not possible. The truck would end up being 25 feet (laughs) along one dimension. (laughs) So it wouldn't even fit. (laughs) But anyway, what the kids Uh, are talking about on this clip is they have hit upon the fact that the shape changes between the commas. And it goes cube, long, pallet, cube, long, pallet, cube, long, pallet, and it just keeps getting bigger. And that's fascinating they to me also, that they, you know, they pulled know. that out. Yeah. And they also hit upon the fact that when you multiply by 10, of course, you, you can move the number over and put the zero on the right. But they figured out why, and they realized that because of the commutative property, that if you were multiplying by 10, like 10 times 100, you also had 100 tens. And so, therefore, the 100 had to move over because and you had to put a zero down to get a 1,000 so that you could then see that on the left, there are now 100 tens. They also hit upon the idea that no matter how many, if you were going to multiply a hundred, say, times a thousand, that a hundred was really 10 times 10, and a hundred was 10 times 10 times 10. And I introduced at that moment exponents because it was natural since they were talking about it. And then they realized they had 10 to the second times 10 to the third. 
And the answer was going to be 10 to the fifth. And they knew why. And these kids were eight years old. I actually, it's a four. Uh, these right. are in grade four. I want right. to say that again, correct? Uh, grade believe four, it or not, uh, the film that you're going to look at, I filmed in May in grade three. But I knew the content was going to be hard for a lot of third graders. And I decided to make it a grade four unit to align with our common core. But honestly, you are looking at third graders. And they get up in the Congress and two pairs get up and they argue the associative property and then they argue the shape and then they argue the exponents. And then they say, for example, if you have 10 to the 21st power, we know it's going to be one with 21 zeros. But we also can tell you what shape it's going to be because every three, there's a pattern of every three. You know what this is an amazing example of is... It proves the point for all those teachers that say, you know, like, I can't teach this way because I have to cover all the curriculum expectations in my time. And, and, you know, you just unpacked one workshop or math workshop lesson where those kids went farther than they would have if I just laid out the lessons in a linear fashion. Exactly. When I wrote that unit initially, the draft I had going in did not include exponents. I wasn't planning on teaching exponents or, you know. I, it was those unruly kids who made it happen. Yeah. We have to be ready for it, right? <laughs> so I just quickly, though, want to now tell you what I did with that about mentor text. So the kids developed their own proof and it was quite nice. And I supported them and, you know, I helped confer around their proof. But after everybody shared and the Congress was over, I had written my own proof using the children's work and tightened it up so it was a crisp proof. And then I got so excited about what you were doing, I wrote a proof about exactly what you were talking about too. Your proof's beautiful. Here's mine. Mathematicians love writing proofs and mathematicians never write the same proof, you know, because they're all writing their own. I love yours. You got me excited. I'll share mine now. Now, mine was crisper. I wrote it crisply on purpose because I wanted it to be a mentor text. So I don't know. I didn't hurt ownership at all. The kids had already owned their own proof. I filmed it. But I wasn't happy with it. It went too long. So I didn't put it on the platform. But we do have the footage of it. And I put out to my staff this past summer this idea that I want to work on mentor texts and invited anybody that wants to try doing some things in classrooms. I don't have the time to sit and plan things with people. But if you try things and you do something that you really like, then send it to me. I would really love to see what you're doing and what success you're having. And I'm starting to try to do it too. And I'm happy as I just shared, you know, happy to share with you successes I have. Oh, that would be great. I would love to see the actual video of the proof piece there. That's very curious to me. I'm geeked out. I know the problem, but to think of what those students did with that problem I'm sure people are listening and they're just jaws dropped going like, you've got to be kidding me. But at the same time, you definitely have that shows that the intentionality behind the work that you're doing and making sure that you're paying attention to those moves and really giving students the clearly there's a community that you've built, right? A community of mathematicians, as you've expressed earlier. And, and that's something that's so important to build that community. And it will take a while for those listening but give it time and just keep working at it. And with resources like what Kathy's mentioned, I think it's definitely doable if we're willing to give it a shot. Yep. Well, Kathy, we can't thank you enough for joining us here tonight. I know that I've learned so much just in this conversation. And I know that all the teachers listening here right now would probably agree with me. So we just want to thank you for joining us. And we really hope to uh, connect with you in the future. I think both of us are going to jump on that opportunity you just gave us. And I'm sure there's teachers out there to uh, jump on this and construct proofs with our students. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I look forward to hearing it when it goes live. Let me know. Okay. Have a great night, Kathy. Great. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks. We just want to thank Kathy one more time for joining us on this episode. Kathy, we know you are listening right now. You have so many insights into learning and your laugh, oh my gosh, it is contagious. Kyle, I know you had some takeaways here. So 
Let's hear it. Oh my gosh, John, you are so right. That laugh is contagious and I just don't know where to begin. I can't get enough of the learning I get out of the many conversations I've been lucky enough to have with Kathy over these past couple years. John, you and I focus a lot on rich tasks and while this is great for getting kids into the doing of mathematics, it can be easy to feel like you're spinning your wheels and maybe not covering curriculum because you aren't managing to find a way to uncover those ideas we've been mandated to teach. I love how she called out this big issue as many try their best to teach through task, but often find themselves feeling as though they aren't getting to where they need to go. And you and I, John, often have conversations with teachers who are trying to break free from more traditional teaching practices, as well as break away from units to interleaving or spiraling, but then find themselves struggling to organize their course where those big ideas come out. It's great to hear that Kathy recognizes that this is a common challenge for math teachers, and that's what she's working towards, as well as what we're working towards through this podcast. How about you, John? What resonated with you? You know, as humans, we try strategies when we want to solve problems. And it's natural for us to move along progressions with those strategies, let's say from like uh, contextual to more efficient strategies. And, you know, I think it's important for us to show our students how to move along those progressions. And I liked uh, especially how she mentioned that uh, when, when she was working with a group they were calling them, they'd also thought about these learning progressions, but they were calling them learning lines. And she said, you know, she did not want to call them learning lines because she said they're not linear. Like these progressions are not linear. She called them landscapes because they're like these big ideas, these clusters that kind of live near each other, kind of like a landscape. And I thought that that was such a simple yet huge idea. And I appreciated thinking of it that way. You're so right, John. And I love in her resources how she does have landscapes and they actually she builds them out like landscapes. They can be overwhelming when you look at them at first glance. But if you really start from the bottom and you start and you just see that, you know, some students are going to kind of go this way and some might go that way. It's just really important for us to be aware that it's not necessarily going to be a this than that sort of situation. So I can't agree more. You know what, John, we've been getting a lot of feedback through email on Twitter, Facebook, on Instagram. And you know what would be great if everyone who's listening right now, no matter where you are, you're walking the dog, on a run, at the gym, mowing the lawn, driving to work. Okay, well, maybe not if you're driving, don't do this. But wherever you are, we want you to just stop. Just stop and take your phone out of your pocket and take a photo. Not of you, but of where you are, what you are doing. You can be in the photo, but we want to see where are people listening to this podcast. And we want you to take that photo. We want you to tweet us at Make Math Moments on Twitter or on Instagram at Make Math Moments or on Facebook. You can go to facebook.com forward slash Make Math Moments and let us know where you are listening to this podcast right now. Let us know. We can't wait to see where you are. And you know what? If you don't have a social account, you can email us admin at makemathmoments.com. Yeah, that would be super cool. Like, imagine we saw this tweet and you're like, you've just you know climbed, not like a mountain, but you were on a hike and you got to the top <laughs> of this lookout. People are feeling bad about themselves. They're just on a walk yeah. and yeah. John wants you on a mountain, right. you know, right. but that's okay. Yeah. If you're like, if you're at the top of a lookout and you're like, I'm just listening to this episode, boom, I'm going to take this picture. I think that would be super cool. Or maybe you're just riding the lawnmower. You could just shoot us a picture. That would be super Super cool too. I think it would be awesome to see where all our math moment makers are. Where are you right now? Can't wait to see what you send us. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I'm super excited about that. I can't wait. We actually are really looking forward to this episode coming out. So awesome stuff. One quick reminder before we exit here. If you are interested in becoming one of our founding members in the Make Math Moments Academy, be sure to check out makemathmoments.com forward slash academy. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash academy. Check it out. See if it's right for you. We can't wait to dive into some deep learning with all of you. In order to ensure you don't miss out on new episodes as they come out each week, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Also, if you're liking what you're hearing, please share the podcast with a colleague and help us reach a wider audience by leaving us a review on iTunes, Google Play, 
Spotify, or whatever platform you are listening to right now. Show notes and links to resources from this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 24. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 24. You can also find Make Math Moments on all social media platforms and seek out our free private Facebook group, Math Moment Makers, K through 12. Well, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high fives for you.